apart And that laugh Wrinkles your nose Touches my Foolish heart Baby, you're lovely Lovely Never, never change Keep that breathless charm Won't you please arrange it Cause I love you And the way you look tonight tenderness grows tearing my fear apart and that laugh wrinkles your nose touches my my foolish heart baby you're lovely lovely never never change Keep that breathless charm Won't you please arrange it Cause I love you And the way you look Just the way you look That's the way you look Tonight You can dance every dance with the guy who gives you the eye. Let him hold you tight. You can smile every smile for the man who held your hand neath the pale moonlight. But don't forget who's taking you home and in whose arms you're going to be. Darling, save the last dance for me. Oh, I know that the music's fine like sparkling wine. Go and have your fun. Laugh and sing. But while we're apart, don't give your heart to anyone. Don't forget who's taking you home and in whose arms you're gonna be. So, darling, Save the last dance for me. Baby, don't you know I love you so? Can't you feel it when we touch? I will never, ever let you go. I love you oh so much. Carry on till the night is gone 
and it's time to go. If she asks, you can walk you home one day, but you must tell her no. And don't forget, he's taking you home in his arms you're gonna be. Oh, darling, save the last dance for me. Don't put me when she take you home. Wanna be. So, darling, save the last dance for me. So, darling, save the last dance for me. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the ninth annual Innovator of the Year Awards. Come on in, find your seats. We're about ready to start our program in just a few minutes. Thank you. Living on sponge cake, watching the sun bake. All of the tourists covered with oil. Strumming my six screen on my front porch swing. Smell of those shrimp beginning to boil. Wasting away again, Margaritaville. Searching for my lost shaker of salt. Some people claim there's a woman to blame, but I know, well, it's only my fault. Well, I don't know the reason, stay here all season with nothing to show but this brand new tattoo. It's a real beauty, a Mexican cutie. How it got here, I haven't a clue. Wasting away again in Margaritaville. Searching for my lost shaker of salt. Salt, salt. Some people claim there's a woman to blame. Well, I know it could be my fault. my flip-flop, stepped on a pop-top, I cut my heel, I had to head back home, but there's booze in the blender, and soon it will render, Tiffany, and how it got here, I haven't a clue. Wasting away again in Margaritaville. Searching for my lost shaker of salt. Salt, salt. Some people claim there's a woman to blame. Well, I know it's my own damn fault. Some people claim there's a woman to blame. Well, I know. Well, it is my fault.
right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, take your seats. We're going to start in a minute or two here. Thank you. Welcome to the ninth annual Innovator of the Year Awards. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with a light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans, White with foam, God bless America, my home, sweet home. God bless America, my home, sweet. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Richard Reisman, the publisher of the Orange County Business Journal. It's my pleasure to welcome you all here and to congratulate all of our nominees. And the Business Journal is proud to present this, our eighth annual Innovator of the Year Award program. Let me take a moment, please, to acknowledge the sponsors who make our event possible, our diamond sponsor, Cox Business. Yeah. Our platinum sponsors, Jeffrey M. Verdon Law Group, PNC Financial, RJI CPAs, Stradling, UCI Health, And our silver sponsor, Cathwork, Edwards Life Sciences, and Northern Trust. We're very proud to have the support of such outstanding organizations to honor Orange County's innovators. Now we'd like to acknowledge our vice president and associate publisher, Laura Garrett, and our editor, Mark Mueller. That stand. Come on. There we go. Today's event is the work of Laura and the advertising department staff. Uh, the Innovator of the Year Award special report, our weekly newspapers, and the daily news updates are the work of Mark Mueller and our editorial department. Uh, we will be uh, profiling today's award winners in the issue a week from Monday the September 19th issue. And please, let me remind you all not to forget to turn your cell phone ringers back on at the conclusion of the program. Uh, we'll resume at 1240 with the keynote address by Tony Smith, co-founder and CEO of Restaurant 365, followed by the presentation of the awards. Now please enjoy your meal. We'll see you soon.
welcome everyone. We're back and it's now time to commence the program. I'll be quick, I'll just introduce Rebecca Rosen, Senior Director of Field and Product Marketing at Cox Business. Please join me with a warm welcome. Hi. <laughs> oh, I'll try that again. Hello. Yeah. All right. Post lunch, you know, a little sleepy, so try and get everybody going here. Um, so thank you so much for your introduction, and thank you to the Orange County Business Journal for this amazing event. Uh, I lead product innovation and marketing in the Western United States, and I'm very happy to call Orange County home. Um, I'm really delighted to help kick off this eighth annual Innovator Awards. This is just a tremendous community, and it's through innovation that we create sustainability for our communities, and Cox Business is really proud to be a part of that innovation. What you may not know about us is that for over 120 years and four generations, Cox Business has been part of innovation. In fact, we got our start in the newspaper and media business, and here we are, a technology innovator in 2022. In fact, we have a new uh, innovation hub that has led us into the likes of cloud services, IoT, healthcare innovation, uh, clean tech, and even agriculture. And again, it's through that innovation that has provided 120 years of sustainability, not only you know, jobs within our community, but also money to our community, our commitment to the community, um, what we, you know, the people who live here, how we invest our money, all of those sorts of things. And we'll ensure that for the next 120 years that we're still here. And the reason why I call that out is because that's what you all are doing. Um, it is through your innovation that you're creating a sustainable future for us, for community members, for people's health, for your businesses, for the people you employ. It is through your innovation that you create a sustainable future for everyone, not only in our community. So I applaud all of you. Um, I would like to ask that our Innovator of the Year nominees stand up. chills. Oh my goodness, I actually really have chills. Um, thank you so much for your innovation. I think that we all will hear more today, but have read and will continue to read about the amazing accomplishments that are happening right here in Orange County, and quite frankly, right here in this room. I'm really happy to be rubbing elbows um, with these amazing innovators right here. Um, thank you for your dedication to innovation and support of this year's innovators, and we really do wish you all continued success and innovation. Um, together, our nominees and past winners exemplify the true spirit of innovation, and we just can't wait to see uh, not only what you're doing and how that comes to fruition, but what happens next. As you guys can see, innovation plays a large role in our community, and we congratulate all of this year's nominees um, on the game-changing products and services that you guys have created. Uh, now, I actually have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker who exemplifies innovation in Orange County, Tony Smith, the co-founder of Restaurant 365 which is a, rapid, a rapidly growing innovation, uh, industry leading restaurant software platform. In Tony's current role, he focuses his energy on company vision,
vision and long-term strategy, building and engaging and inviting culture, and growing individuals um, and the business. A lifelong earner, learner, he earned his bachelor's degree in business management and information systems from Brigham Young University, where he earned uh, magnum cum, uh, magna cum laude. Uh, he is a dad joke connoisseur, which um, for those people who know me know that we have an instant connection. Um, and he <laughs> uh, enjoys having fun while trying out new restaurants, spending time with his wife and his four lovely daughters singing and watching college football. So please join me in welcoming an alumni innovator of the year recipient and keynote speaker, Tony Smith. Well, thank you so much, uh, Rebecca. That was, that was a kind introduction. Uh, and thank you to Cox and the other sponsors for helping make this event possible. Uh, really grateful to be up here sitting next to Richard and, and to have met so many of the wonderful folks at the Orange County Business Journal, such champions of business here in Orange County and putting on great events like this uh, to help honor uh, so many of the wonderful businesses. Uh, really impressed with the people who are here, with the nominees this year. I, I had a chance to meet a number of you before this event and there are some amazing innovations going on here. I'm really glad that I won the award a prior year because I, I don't know that I could hang with this group this time, uh, but excited to see uh, the winners awarded today for their hard work. Um, I talk more about all of you, but I only have 20 minutes and I wanna talk about myself. So we better, oh, we get, better get moving. <laughs> oh, thank you, wow. So, uh, you know, I, I, I have a few important topics I need to hit. Uh, it says here, I need to cover Pigs, a failed business, and my pants. So we better get moving. You'll have to listen to some of those things. Uh, just for your info, the my pants is not reference to wetting my pants at an age that was much older than it should have been in public. And for all you know, that never happened. And we're not going to talk about it, so we'll be okay. I want to talk a little bit about uh, my history, but really about lessons in innovation. You know, about being an innovator and and some of the key things that I've learned uh, along the way, I still have so much to learn and such a long journey to go. But I have a few things that I've, that I've gleaned so far. I was gonna finish my story. I was gonna start early in college years and then finish with Restaurant 365, but they kind of, I didn't hear a spoiler alert. They kind of spoiled, that's what I'm doing now. So you know the end at the beginning, but I'm excited to still cover a few of these things. So going back to college, uh, I, I studied business management with a minor or an emphasis in information systems. And the reason I did that is I grew up without a computer in the home and I hated computers. And I never saw myself as a software person. Those were nerdy people. And uh, so I never thought that that's what I was going to end up working in. But it was at a time where you could tell computers were really taking off and they were gonna be a part of everything that most all of us did in some form or another. And so I thought, I need to make this a topic I study in, in college to both not be behind the times, but also prove to myself, I can take on something that's very hard and that I'm very uncomfortable with, because if I can do that and succeed here, I felt like that would give me uh, lessons later in life, more confidence to do other hard things. And so I think uh, when I graduated, I ended up getting a job in software, right? Which shouldn't be a shocker that you get hired for what you study. But for some reason while studying it, I really wasn't intending to work in that. And so I, I think that's, that'll be innovator lesson number one for me is that I would like to point out here is along the way, put deposits in your confidence and learning bank account. There's times where you learn things that, that later on in life you can pull from that will give you confidence. Write those things down. Remember them. Those are the hard fought lessons that you've learned in life that so many of you as innovators here in Orange County have gone through trials and learned from things. I hope you take the time to record some of those so that when times get tough later, you're able to pull that out and, and feel the confidence from those deposits you've put in the bank. And there's been times at Restaurant 365 where, uh, where things have been difficult, where they haven't gone according to plan. And, and looking back on and using some of those lessons to share with others in the company 
have really helped give me and, and some of our team members confidence in some hard times. Uh, you know, you can imagine COVID during the restu- for the restaurant industry was very difficult. And so being in restaurant software, we had a lot of learnings then. And so luckily I have a lot of deposits to pull from because I've messed up so many times. I've learned a lot of things and, and so I get to continue to pull from that. So after college, let's move on to my first job after college. So when I graduated, I had an opportunity to choose from really large businesses or a very, very small business, just a a few guys who had just started it the year prior and just had a couple customers. And so that was a big decision for me at the time. I I made a list, pros and cons, and the larger company had higher pay. It had a better career path. They actually had a career path for me, and it would look much more impressive on a resume. And the small company really didn't have many of those pros. And and that's a time where I learned another thing about myself, and that is that none of those things really mattered to me. I was willing to go to the smaller business, that's what I ended up choosing, and take less pay, and not really have a name to put behind things, and not know where it was going to go. There was some insecurity there. Uh, because of one fact, this is what I learned about myself, that I really wanted to go somewhere where I felt like I could make a difference and that the decisions that I was making mattered to the trajectory of the company. That, that's really what I wanted. And, and so that'll be my second innovator lesson for us here. That lesson is build your company culture deliberately with three things that I think are important in any culture. Uh, I think company cultures are all different, but I think there's three things that fit into anyone. That is growth, learning, and intrinsic value that people receive from working there. So I'd like to just touch on those very briefly. The intrinsic value, I feel like, come from this tripod. There's three things. One of them is autonomy. And so people should feel like they have control over what they're doing at work. They should feel like they have control over the four T's, if you've heard that before Um, their time, you know, maybe when they're working or how that works, the tools they use, the team members they're with, and some of the tasks that they're doing. And when they have more control over that, they will have personal value in the things that they're doing. So that that is a key part to culture for me. Uh, Another one is learning, a love of learning. Sometimes people ask me, what's the number one most important skill you think will make someone successful at Restaurant 365? And I always say a love of learning. I, I think that that brings with it many things. Part of it is humility, knowing that you haven't, uh, quote, arrived. You know, there's more to be done, and, and also someone who's going to continue to be more for your organization. And, and so that's an important part, I think, of any culture. And then lastly is growth. Um, growth in the business, in customers, in employee count, in the products and what you're offering, all of those things, that's so motivating to people. I think it's it goes without saying that it's such a key part of the culture because people can see where they might be in the future as part of a growing organization. Uh, so that, that culture is something that's extremely important to me. One of the things that I think matters in the culture is having it be a safe environment. People feel safe to make a mistake and safe to learn. And so what are some of the ways we do that? I have silly sayings, and one of them is that you should be willing to tell people you don't agree with them or that you don't like something they did uh, through friendly front stabbing. So no backstabbing. You just come right to their face, right in the belly, right? And, and so the friendly front stabbing is, you know, there's no politics. You aren't going and telling someone else. You're not telling on them to the teacher. And, and so then the other side of that is how do you receive a friendly front stab? You know, because that's never fun. And that is instead of don't shoot the messenger, it is fist bump the messenger. So you should thank the messenger for being brave enough to have told you something difficult, right? Something that you can learn from and, and, and work on. And so when you have both of those things happening, it creates an incredible environment for people to learn and grow together, to make mistakes and, and learn from them and then deposit those in their bank accounts so they can pull from them later. And, uh, you know, really, I think it ends up with one saying I really like, which is ego is the killer of the right solution. And when those other things I described are present, ego is set aside. I, I think that's really important. So culture is key. Next up, uh, after that, uh, I've been working in that job for about two years, and I had an idea with one friend of mine that we should start another company. And we wanted to keep our day job, so we did it at night. We wanted to start this software business called the Care Portal. And I'm 
seeing all kinds of nods out there. You all love the Care Portal. You've been using it recently. No, because it's not in business. It was a huge failure. None of you have ever heard of it. That's, uh, that's unfortunate, but true. So we started that, and we worked at night for about four months writing this new software application for an industry, trying to start this business. And we ended up about four months in getting our first version of the product. We went out to a pretty large organization. We flew out to Texas on the cheapest flights possible because it was on our dime. We stayed in a Motel 6. We shared a room even. And my, my business partner would claim that someone snoring kept him up at night. He had a terrible night's sleep. I don't know that I believe that because he sure seemed with it when we killed the sales presentation. And that company agreed to use our product the next day. So it was, it was a really good experience. But then a week after that, a large organization that did software heard of us kind of encroaching on their industry. And they went to that same company and said, you can use ours for a year for free if, if you will drop this other product. And they did. And we didn't have the funds. We couldn't do a year for free. We couldn't even stay in two rooms in the Motel 6. So for us, that was trouble. And we, we ended up making a couple other calls to other businesses. And it was very apparent that company was basically going to follow us around and do that to us. And so we, we closed up shop. We shut the doors. That product never really saw the light of day, unfortunately. And so I think that takes me to the third innovator lesson I'll share today. And that is, what are the factors that are really necessary for a startup to be successful? So I think that there's three pillars, and you have to have two of those three, or I don't see how you can be successful. Number one pillar, you have to have enough money. So it takes some funds. Number two is that you need to have the willingness to risk or the ability in your stage in life to take some risks and that failing would be okay. So money and risk. And then the last one is maybe the most important, product market fit. And we'll, I'll touch on that a little bit more in a bit. But I feel like you have to have two of those three because if you have money and you're willing to risk it, you have quite a bit of money, you don't need product market fit right off the bat. You can test and trial and, oh, that one didn't work. Keep putting some more money in. You know, if you, have, if you nail product market fit and you're willing to risk maybe your current career and things that go all in, then you may not need as much money because you, you thread the needle right off the bat. Um, but for us, we failed there in the care portal because we definitely didn't have the money and we weren't willing to give up the day job or risk in really any way. We had young families and so all we had was product market fit. That was proven because that company did want to buy what we had, but without those other two, we crumbled. So, so that happened. Once you have those, I think there's really two other pillars that can be helpful and that is core talent, which is usually the founders at the beginning. And then the other part is early adopters, folks who are going to use it maybe for free and give you some feedback. So those were all important things. And so the distinction was six years later, I started Restaurant 365 with two other fantastic co-founders. And we went in eyes wide open. It was a very different experience. I remember we made a spreadsheet. We were going to put in our own money month after month after month. And we made a spreadsheet that shows that we were actually going to put in our own money for three straight years. And then for two more years, we weren't going to put it in, but it wasn't going to give us anything back. And, and that was an ugly spreadsheet to look at. And I'll never forget the time we looked in each other's eyes and we said, are you in? You've seen it. Are you in? Because we can't get to year two and then say, why aren't we making money yet? You know, no, we know right now what it's going to take. And, and I'm so glad to have the co-founders that I did in that we were all in and we did start this business. So that was great because we had money. We definitely had the willingness to risk. And then early on, we came out in the restaurant industry with a product that hit product market fit. So we actually had all three and, and that really was valuable for us. So just a moment on product market fit. Uh, I just like to say, what is it? For me, product market fit is finding a problem someone has and really solving it. That's it. So uh, sometimes people will come and ask me, hey, I want to start a business and I'm thinking about this industry. What should I do? Go find a problem they have and solve that problem. That's it. It's very simple. And, and so, of course, there's a lot of ways to arrive at that. You can interview great customers. You can keep your eye out into the public. There's, there's lots of ways to gather the info, but ultimately, that is what you're going to do. Uh, another thing that I think is key with the product fit is AAV. We use that acronym at our company, always adding value. And so I, I drill our team on that all the time. Whenever someone has a product idea, I say, how does that add value to our customers? 
And so if, if they can't clearly articulate that, it's kind of back to the drawing board, right? So a lot of times I think we fall in love with our idea or our product, and I really think we should fall in love with our customers. And when you fall in love with your customers, you're going to do things to make their lives better. So that's a huge difference. Um, one last thing maybe on that. Oh, I, actually, you should also fall in love with your spouse. My wife's here, so points one. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Jesse. Uh, yes, so one, one other aspect of it besides, uh, besides the following, falling in love, you should spend more time talking to the downers than the uppers. And that's hard. People who left you, customers who left, or people who never wanted to do business with you in the first place. Those aren't fun conversations to have, but those are the ones you learn from the most. So that's really where you should try to spend as much time. If we were keeping with the romance theme, then that would be like um, talking with exes who dumped you or maybe the people who never said yes to a date in the first place. I think that would be pretty soul-crushing. when it, That's very personal. But hopefully in business, you can do that, and it's not quite as bad. Um, Next up, well, I have a few learnings here. We're going to have to skip a few of them. We'll go into something learned here at Restaurant 365. I need to have enough time to talk about my pants. So I'm just combing through here. I've got to, I, we're going to skip hiring the right people. Chat with me sometime, and we'll talk about it if you care. Uh, we will skip your second act as a business, how to come up with a second major product and what you do there. As you can tell, I'm excited about it, but not excited enough. So let's, um, I'm just combing down here. I'm. I'm going right to the pants tower. Okay, so in my closet years ago, I would hang all my pants up, my dress pants. And that was at a time where I wore dress pants to work before I, I worked at this restaurant software company, in which case I never wear dress pants anymore. That's one of the perks. So, uh, but I used to, and I'd get home from work and I would hang these pants up. And then after a while, I got kind of lazy. You know, sometimes I get home from work, and instead of hanging them up, there was this little shelf right above my hangers. I just kind of fold the pants and set them on the shelf because I was too busy to take 10 seconds to hang them up, I guess. You know, it, it seems so lazy. But then a couple days would go by, maybe I'd get multiple pairs of pants. Well, there was one time that changed my life. I had nine pairs of pants. And when I went to the, to the hanger the next day to put some pants on, I had a tower of nine pants folded up on top of the shelf. It was starting to be kind of ski wampus, you know. It was, it was uh, leaning, and all my hangers were empty. And I needed some pants, and I actually wanted to wear the pants that were on the bottom. So I reached over to grab these pants, and as I pulled them, this whole stack of pants falls down. And, and I'm someone who's very particular about things. I was really mad in the moment, at, and, and I was angry, like, wow, how could this happen? And then I realized, after a second, I'm mad at myself. I'm mad at past Tony Smith, who was too lazy to hang up these pants. That's who I'm angry at. And so I, I had this realization in that moment that we need to know what we're responsible for and do it in the moment, or else we're just passing the buck to someone else. And a lot of times, that buck might be our future selves, right? Which is even worse. And so I, I learned a great lesson from the Tower of Pants that day. And I actually have hung up my pants every day since that I come home. If I'm wearing pants that have a hanger, every day. Thank you. I saw a little clap there. Yeah, that is a life accomplishment. So um, that, that was the parable there. And so how, why is that innovator lesson, I guess, number four that I'm going to share? Um, that's lesson number four because I think it's very important that we know our priorities and our detailed responsibilities and that we choose to act upon those. That's what's important, and it, it applies to business so much. So here's how I do it today. As an executive, uh, many of you are executives out there, you know that you get to choose how you spend your time, right? You get to choose a little bit of your job description. And with all that leeway, when I became CEO, uh, for, for a while when Restaurant 365 was growing, I just wore 15 hats and didn't really have any titles, right? And most of us all were doing that. Um, but over time, at some point, it became time to say, okay, Tony Smith is the CEO here. And then I had to think, what is my job now? Like, do I just keep wearing these 10 hats? Do I need to take a couple off? And, and I looked at some books, but there's no real clear guidance. If you're a CEO, you do these exact things. And I asked another CEO who was really successful, what do you think I should do? And he said, oh, I know exactly what a CEO does, whatever the company needs. I'm like, that's the worst advice. Like, I, I, need, I'm, I'm, I need something very specific. And so I've come up with a couple things that have helped me. Number one is, like I said, set your priorities. And those priorities change, so be flexible. So 
my priorities for those that are interested right now, probably zero of you, are number one, company culture. As you can tell, I'm very passionate about that because I brought it up already today. Number two is that we are all al aligned around a clear vision and goals, and we're accountable to those, right? There's, that takes a lot of communication and goal setting. Number three is that we have a rock star executive team. And I have a couple of my execs who are here today, and Chris Sunberg and Jill Burke. I'm so grateful for them and what they do at our company. But we have a full executive team of folks like them who do incredible work and it takes some effort on my part as well to attract the right people and keep things flowing so so that's number three for me number four is really our long-term strategy what are we going to be doing two years from now that nobody has any time to even think about right now right well I do I need to make time for that so I'm looking ahead and then lastly is make sure we don't run out of money so I'm out there, I talk to financial institutions, we fundraise when we need to, there's things out in the public uh, eye that I'm doing. And, and so those are really my priorities right now. But the second thing that I do, so you remember I said priorities and detailed responsibilities. So how do I handle the responsibilities? But I make a quadrant. You guys probably think like he's the worst guy to be married to because I have all these very specific things and my wife is laughing because it's true. So. I make this quadrant, and, and here's the quadrant. I have love it, don't love it. And then I have on the side, great at it, not great at it. So you end up with this quadrant up here that you love and you're great at. And I take all the responsibilities. What have I been doing recently? And I do this once a year. I take my responsibilities and I write them in the quadrants. So, hey, here's something I'm doing, and I love that, and I'm killing it, so that goes in this great quadrant up here. And some of them fall in other spots, right? And, and so then what I do with that quadrant is I say, okay, the ones that I love, at, uh, love and I'm great at, we're going to keep doing those things because they drive me and they drive the business. The ones that I don't love and I'm not great at, those are the dogs. we got to get those off of my plate. Find someone who's great at it, someone who can do that and enjoy it. And so those I try to move off as quickly as possible. And then you get these other two quadrants. You have things that you've got to be really careful on. Those are the ones you love, but you're not great. They're so fun, you know. But as your company grows, you might not be the right person to do those anymore. And so you have to be willing to take that hat off and, and pass that on to someone where, whose hands it can live in. Uh, sometimes I, I mention that with our software code. Um, I, I, along with another person, wrote the first version of our product. And I'm not the greatest programmer in the world, and, and our program is used by a lot of restaurants these days, and they all deserve better than what Tony Smith could give them. So I tell our team all the time, I hope you've replaced every single line of code that I've written because it deserves your quality now, right? And so there's things that you have to give up. I haven't written a line of code in our product, it's embarrassing to say, but in five years. I'm like moved on from being a nerd and I'm becoming cooler now because it's been so long since I've written some SQL. Um, and, uh, but, but there are things we have to move on from there. And then lastly is this quadrant of things that you don't love but that you may be great at. And those are the ones where for a while you have to take one for the team. Your company needs you to dig in and do those. We all have to do things we don't enjoy, but those are the danger zone because you could burn out if you always do those things. So those are the ones that are very good to be aware of so we can start early training someone up and figuring out ways to have others that can take that on and be just as great at those things as you are. So that quadrant is really helpful for me in deciding the responsibilities. And then just like I learned in the Tower of Pants, you then have to be willing to act on it immediately. So I think I'd like to conclude now. Uh, I've, I've really enjoyed the time with you. I'm so grateful for uh, being selected to give this speech because I've, I've had a lot of fun and not too many of you are asleep, maybe three. So I, most of you have had enough fun as well, which I appreciate. Um, so I think I will leave you with a quote. And I thought about a wise quote. I have a number of quotes I love, as my company could attest. But I decided my favorite animal is the pig. And I promised you all we were going to talk about pigs. And this is it. Never wrestle with a pig because you both get dirty, but the pig likes it. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you very much. much take home value. Thank you, Tony. I know I'm going home uh, afterwards and hanging up my pants. <laughs> <laughs> Tony's got a great company and uh, he was sharing with me one of his responsibilities, he said, is to raise money and he's done that effectively and uh, you know, the last several months a lot of technology companies in the public sector, we all know, have fallen in value but Tony's raising money at higher and higher valuations so he's off to a, a very promising future.
And now to expedite the program, I'm going to introduce all of the presenters to our winners at once. And then we can just go through the whole thing without me popping up every minute. Alexander Rips, Senior Counsel, Jeffrey M. Verdon Law Group. Jared Engel, Regional President, PNC Bank. Gordon McLean, Audit Partner, RJI CPAs. Justin Owen, Shareholder with Gavin. And Dr. Michael Samos, Dean UCLA School of Medicine. And as a reminder to our award recipients, uh, about two minutes would be great. And now, Alexander Rips to present the first award. Good afternoon. I'm Alexander Ripp, Senior Counsel at Verdon Law Group. We are estate planning and tax lawyers, but our real specialty is protecting Orange County's wealthy from lawsuit predators and, and predi predators and creditors through innovative strategies such as our HISA Trust, which stands for Have Your Cake and Eat It Too Trust, and our HELP Trust, which stands for Home Equity and Lifestyle Protection Trust. There are over 15 million lawsuits filed in the U.S. every year. If you haven't been sued yet, it's just a matter of time. Give us a call so we can put a plan in place to protect your empire and your legacy. I'm very pleased to present this Innovator of the Year Award to a remarkable person. He's known around the world as one of the foremost experts and pioneers in stem cell research. He's been a professor at some of the world's top universities for over 15 years. He's advised senators, members of Congress, and even presidents on matters relating to healthcare and biotechnology. As the current CEO of an Irvine-based biomedical company, he's developed personalized vaccines for the treatment of cancer and COVID-19. His personalized cancer immunotherapy uniquely targets the seed of all cancers, tumor-initiating cells. In 2021, his team reported a remarkable 50% improvement in progression-free survival of the typical stand. His COVID-19 vaccine, meanwhile, has undergone clinical testing in Indonesia at the invitation of the Indonesian Ministry of Health and aims to serve nations with limited access to the current vaccines available. If stopping cancer and COVID wasn't enough, this winner is actively involved with multiple charities. He serves on the board of directors for the Plasticos Foundation, a charity that performs reconstructive and plastic surgery in third world countries, and Zero Abuse, a charity that tracks and assists in the conviction of child sex abusers. Last, but certainly not least, he's also a third degree black belt in Taekwondo. I don't know how he does it. I'm pleased to present the Innovator of the Year Award to Dr. Hans Kirstead, CEO of Avita Biomedical. That was a surprise. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank I really, really appreciate this. I think rather than talking about uh, anything, I'm going to tell you about a little story. So I've been a, I was a professor at UCI for 15 years, and uh, I developed a treatment for spinal cord injury, and we could inject a paralyzed rat and make it walk again, and then we did it to humans, and. 50% of the drug into their cervical spinal cord, just half, later the whole amount, and every single human of those 26 humans we treated were able to fully restore their arm use and hand use. We went up to 100% bladder, bowel, and sexual control. And I thought, I did it, me. And then I flew to a hospital in Kentucky and watched the first patient receive my treatment. The first human to have received this, this man, Timothy Atchison, 26-year-old, who was in an accident and had no feeling for his job. And I stood quietly by as the doctor said to the patient, this is a treatment that I developed, that I am putting into humans. And I thought, wait a minute, I did that. That's my treatment. And then later, an individual who wrote a check for something like $50 million to keep me going on this said, 
I watched him take an award once and say, I developed treatment for spinal cord injury. So my point here is that in my naivete with the first treatment I ever developed, now 17 FDA approvals, I thought that my role was larger than it was. But of course, I have matured. You can see the hair color. And I realize that it takes a tribe. It's a team. And the money person is as important as the patient advocate, as, as important as the inventor, is as important as the MD. And no one is as important as the patient. So thank you very much. It's a real honor. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Jared Engel. I'm the regional president and head of corporate banking for PNC Bank here in Orange County and the Inland Empire. On behalf of PNC, I want to congratulate all of this year's finalists. It's been an honor to learn more about your incredible stories of success this year. Southern California tops a list of innovative places in the nation, and I'm proud to live, work, and serve in a place like Orange County, where we are surrounded by innovators who are con constantly changing the landscape of business and everyday life. At PNC Bank, we want to provide Orange County entrepreneurs and businesses with the capital and resources they need to fuel their innovative spirit. So thank you all for the work that you are doing to make our lives seamless, both personally and professionally. And now, let's find out who our second winner is. There were so many amazing candidates for this award, and the committee had a challenge to choose a winner, but the winner stood apart because of the ability to automate a complicated and time-consuming common process, which allows businesses to operate more efficiently and effectively over time. The selected winner is a leader in intelligent document processing focused on accelerating productivity with automation. The founder of the company built it around the idea that a common process that is often complicated, time consuming, and inefficient can be automated and include an AI in its inner workings to make it simple, fast, and efficient. Because of this company, workers no longer need to manually enter data, worry about mistakes or duplicate their efforts, thus making their lives easier through the power of innovation. This founder's company is a solution that captures data, classifies and organizes it, extracts the data, allows validation if necessary, and exports the data into any other system or repository. The founder helps customers across 50 different countries with his global team located in Americas, Europe, and Asia which is no small feat given the geographic dispersion and time zone challenges. Please help me in congratulating our winner, founder and CEO of Episoft, Ike Kavos. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for recognizing my work. Um, I came to the United States 20 years ago with 100,000 in my pocket. And it, there's a lot of grit it takes when you try to innovate. And definitely takes a village. My colleagues, my family who support it deserves all the credit. Um, but it's been, I think, ups and downs. Um, I want to tell all the um, new entrepreneurs that don't give up, keep your spirit up. Um, every week you're going to have a challenge, and the next week you're going to solve that challenge. So keep going. That was very nice. Thank you very much.
Good afternoon. My name is Gordon McLean, and I'm a partner and director of audit services at RJI International CPAs. RJI is an Orange County-based full-service CPA firm that has provided audit and tax services to publicly traded and privately held businesses for over 40 years. Our expertise lies in serving innovative and entrepreneurial businesses with a niche practice in international tax. We're affiliated with DFK International, the seventh largest accounting network in the world, and we currently serve clients around the globe in over 25 different countries. I'm delighted to present this next Innovator of the Year Award. When we think of an innovator, we think trailblazer, groundbreaker, originator, disruptor to an existing industry, or someone who creates something completely new. This is exactly what this next innovator is doing. This individual is working to create a completely new industry. When you remember the first time you heard the word Uber, you said, what's an Uber? Now everyone knows what an Uber is. I would imagine a few people took an Uber here today. Our kids, in fact, don't even know what a taxi is anymore. <laughs> this innovator, well, he's just really smart. He has a PhD in physics, an MS in aeronautics and astronomics from Stanford University, as well as a BA in physics from Cornell University. He's also a private pilot. This innovator is pioneering and expanding an industry known as eVTOL. Joining forces with an aircraft industry veteran and icon, this comp company's legacy dates back to the days of the unmanned aerial predator drone and continued through the A-160 Hummingbird, which solved many issues hampering traditional helicopter flights. Today, they are becoming the leader in advanced air mobility with its all-electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. With 200,000 plus square feet of manufacturing, industrial and corporate space in Santa Ana, fresh with $145 million of recent funding, this company plans to become the Uber of eVTOL, electric vertical takeoff and landing. Imagine the day when you can hop in a six seat aircraft and take a trip from Orange County to downtown LA in 20 minutes during rush hour. Well, my friends, this day is not too far off. Earlier this year, they announced the successful commencement of a full-scale propulsion test system towards a prototype flight in 2023, FAA certification in 2025, and commercial air service in 2026. The world of commuting is about to change. This innovator is also a founding member of the Community Air Mobility Initiative, a 501c3 organization committed to ensuring the proliferation of urban air mobility in all communities. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to present this Innovator of the Year Award to Benjamin Tigner, CEO and co-founder of Overair. so much. Thanks, Gordon. Uh, thanks, Richard. Thank, thanks to the whole uh, uh, Orange County Business Journal and uh, uh, staff for putting this on. Thanks to all the sponsors. This is, this is fantastic. Um, interesting side note on uh, many of the things that uh, uh, Gordon said. Many of you probably don't know. All the things, all of the technical things that led up to where we are right now, they all happened right here in Orange County. Predator was invented here and uh, didn't move to, to San Diego, but uh, uh, there's a tremendous amount of aeronautical innovation going on right right here. I don't think a lot of people are not not aware of it. Um, so uh, uh, he he referenced Uber, and uh, you know, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, never no one ever heard of Uber. Now we don't know anything other than Uber, uh, and so you you heard it here first. EV tall 10 years from now. <laughs> We'll all be flying around on EV tolls. It's kind of a kind of a neat idea, isn't it? 
I mean, it's sort of something we've all dreamed about, watching the Jetsons from uh, way back when. And I think reality will be a little bit different from imagination, but it is coming soon. And for me, it's tremendously exciting to see uh, things that I've been working on for the last 20 years come to fruition and turn into uh, uh, a, a part of the solution to sustainable transportation. This is all electric powered, and it's really exciting to be part of getting the aviation industry away from this deep dependence on fossil uh, fossil fuel. And uh, so I'm really, really happy to be a part of uh, part of that movement. And it's, it's really great to be part of the Orange County community and uh, bring, bring that new industry here. So thanks so much, everybody. Appreciate it. <laughs>
innovator or the inventor, um, you know, to, uh, to, to begin with. But I, I think that being able to deliver a product or a technology to patients in an in innovative way is also very important because there, there's two, there's two ways that we can get better at cancer detection. One is making uh, tools more effective and more accurate. And the second way is making them easier to use and more convenient for the patient because showing up to the doctor or, or getting a test in the first place is half the battle. Uh, so that's how I try to contribute to the business and, and try to work with all of our smart scientists and physicians to bring this technology to, uh, to patients. So thank you, feel very honored, appreciate it. Pleasure to be here this afternoon. I'm Dr. Michael Stamus, Dean of the School of Medicine at UC Irvine. I want to express to you how honored I am to be part of this celebration with so many amazing, uh, esteemed, and talented trailblazers making a difference in the world. Congratulations to all of the nominees and each of you for your impressive, impactful achievements. I'm especially honored to have the opportunity to share a few words about one of our own talented trailblazers at UCI. An internationally renowned chemist, pharmacologist, and vision scientist who embodies our institution's mission to discover, teach, and heal. Considered around the globe as one of the foremost basic science researchers focused on the retina, this individual has a lifelong goal to find a cure for blindness, and he will. Early in his career, back in 2000, he gained widespread notoriety when he was the first to characterize the protein structure of rhodopsin. Probably not familiar to most of you. Rhodopsin is the light-sensitive receptor in the retina that is responsible for initiating the molecular events that lead to visual perception. This early achievement provided the basis for many researchers since that time to understand vision and the structure of photoreceptor cells in the retina and therapeutic advances to help. Since joining the UCI School of Medicine in 2018, he has continued his quest to address the needs of the millions of people who have been robbed of their sight or those afflicted with progressive visual diseases resulting in blindness. He and his team have produced a vast amount of innovative research applying multidisciplinary approaches to the study of phototransduction and the visual cycle to characterize the visual system in health and disease. His work has led to groundbreaking advances in the use of biochemical alterations for early diagnosis of ocular diseases, critical to treatment just like cancer. The earlier you diagnose it, if you have an effective treatment, the better it will be, as well as the stratification of patients for the discovery and validation of pharmacological treatments to forestall progressive blindness or reverse even retinal degenerative disorders. Over the course of his career, he has published hundreds of papers and has been cited more than 54,000 times by other researchers. If that wasn't enough, he holds 29 patents and he has nine pending patents. His accomplishments have brought our university into the forefront of eye health sciences and led to his most recent honor. By the way, this is already inaccurate as of yesterday. I wrote this three days ago the recipient of the 2022 Lewis S. Goodman and Alfred Gilman Award in Receptor Pharmacology by the American Society for Pharmacology and Experimental Therapeutics. Just this past spring, he was elected to become a member of the National Academy of Sciences, arguably the highest honor a scientist can get. In 2019, that wasn't enough, he was elected to the National Academy of Medicine. And he is just, he's also a member of the Polish Academy of Arts and Sciences. Just a couple more awards. I'm not going to mention all of them. We'll be here for another half hour. He received the 2015 Bressler Prize in Vision Science from Lighthouse Guild and the inaugural 2014 Beckman Argyros Award in Vision Research from the Arnold and Be Mabel Beckman Foundation. Importantly, he's one of the very few people to have won two important awards. One called the Kogan Award. In 1996, he got this one. It's given to the most promising young vision scientist and the Friedenwald Award in 2014 for continuously outstanding ophthalmology research. So sort of the junior and the senior uh, best scientists in the world in that area. Uh, he won both of those, which is very rare. And those were from the Association for Research in Vision and Ophthalmology. It's no secret that his work holds great promise for people throughout the world. And we are extremely fortunate to have him and his team here at UCI. With all this said, I'm very pleased to introduce you to the Irving H. Leopold Chair in Ophthalmology and director of our Center for Translational Vision Research at the Gavin Herbert Eye Institute, and this year's Innovator of the Year, 
Dr. Christoph Palczewski. And by, by the way, uh, a little secret, right? You're going to go out and get your car. If you, the first person to go to the valet and spell his name correctly gets their car first. Thank you very much. Uh, this is really a great honor, particularly for somebody who came just four years ago here. And I have uh, two things to just mention, and that may take uh, quite a while. And in this process, I may die because it will be long, but just stay with me. First of all, uh, I came four years ago, and I see the changes in UCI are just incredible in the School of Medicine. And this is really uh, a testament to our leadership, including the Stainless. Uh, I haven't seen anything like that anywhere in the country of the growth and potential that is now realized here in, in our neighborhood. The second is something that is extremely important for me in the last uh, few years. And um, I'm sure there are a lot of kids here at the table, but it also some more mature people. And you know, there are many promises that were made over time and not all of them were fully realized uh, or they were fake or they were not really paying off as we were hoping. But today, I think we, we can uh, lift our head up and say we on the time of medical breakthroughs and changes that will revolutionize medicine. And this technology called gene editing will enable us to uh, remove all of the genetic defects uh, for varieties of diseases. Of course, for me, it's very important, the eye. Uh, and this is not a fake. This is something that we all will benefit from this technology as it develops for inherited diseases, but also uh, for uh, acquired diseases that can be strengthened by specific changes in our uh, genome. So uh, with that, I just would like to again thank you very much. Until next time, I hope. So it's a proud day to be a Orange County, and we have a lot of great innovation going on here. You got medical, you got aeronautics, you got tech, biotech. I'm very proud to be in the publication that kind of chronicles, you know, all of these people and all of these people's accomplishments, and it's an exciting time and an exciting place to be. Um, at this point, I'd like to ask Tim to step back up. Just a token of our appreciation um, for your outstanding and meaningful remarks that you made today. And I want to thank the Surf and Sand Resort for making your staycation possible. Well, the good news is, as you witnessed, you know, we had uh, five great recipients just like last year when Tony won. But every year there's such a crop of people that uh, we have to overlook and uh, come back next year and see uh, their recognitions. I'd also like to thank everyone at the Orange County Business Journal who makes these events go so seamlessly. Tiffany Benando, Melanie Collins, Jamie Derby, Amanda Dang, Caitlin Nirenberg, Summer Bold, Bobby Dorman, Kim Lopez, Corinne Decker, Shelley Asher, Steve Gall. And thank you for our vendors who are listed in the program. I'd also like to ask all the award recipients to step over here afterwards for our group photo. And finally, there's a business journal probably under your chair. Uh, take a look at the back cover. If it has an orange sticker, that beautiful bouquet of flowers on your table belongs to you. So treat your wife or treat yourself. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next year.